Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for coming to our talk. Uh, my name is Sam Peasley. I'm a product manager at uh, Harvard Medical School. Um, really quickly, um, I wanted to introduce Tony, Michael. So I'll go ahead and uh, you guys want to go. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> um, so this, this presentation is about uh, multi-sites and micro-teams. Um, and, and, you know, we title it Maintaining Multi-Tenant Web Properties at Harvard Medical School. Um, and so as a product manager, I'm gonna quickly go over um, sort of the landscape at HMS and sort of how we think about work out on our team uh, and how we kind of juggle, you know, a few dozen websites uh, with, a, with a pretty small team. Um, so with that, uh, again, we're from, we're from Harvard Medical School. It's, uh, I'm sure you've heard of it. <laughs> um, uh, the way Harvard is sort of structured, uh, it's very decentralized. Um, and so, you know, all the schools operate very independently. Um, and basically how that translates is, you know, when we, when, you know, projects like this come about, um, the teams tend to be pretty small. Um, so in our case, we have about, you know, three to four people that work on uh, Drupal, Drupal sites uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, in the past, uh, as it pertains to this this uh, this project and, and this this product that we, we support, um, we had uh, about five or six years ago a lot of the Drupal instances were managed independently. So we had a few dozen websites that all operated and uh, were managed, um, you know, individually. Uh, and you know, long story short, we recognized the problem and we uh, wanted to create you know a solution that was more sustainable. Uh, you know, so we can you know we can uh, adhere to best practices that it means to accessibility and make them, you know, all of our, you know, designs mobile friendly and things like that. And so they're on brand and, they're, and everything, and they're a little easier to maintain. Um, so really the genesis of this team was to create a product that could, that could scale across the school and uh, be able to operate as the sort of the, the primary HMS Drupal system, uh, Drupal, Drupal instance that HMS supports. Um, so the website landscape, at HMS, what does it look like? So our audience, we tend to think about our audience in sort of two fragments. Um, we mainly call them internal and external <laughs> audiences, I think, internally. Um, but our, I our internal audience uh, is very large. Uh, just at HMS, it consists of about 30 to 40,000 people. Um, this is faculty, staff, students, and alumni that use our websites on a daily basis to get news, to check out their departments, um, to get connected with different events across the HMS ecosystem. Um, and our external audience, sort of what that translates into uh, on a monthly basis is we get about 31 million search impressions off of Google. Um, uh, for our page views, uh, we have about 600,000 users on a monthly basis and generate about 1.5 uh, million page views a month. Um, our web community, the people that work on these websites on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, is rather large. There's about 150 site editors uh, across 40 websites that, that we manage. And while um, I think there's, there's hundreds of websites at Harvard Medical School, again, we're really talking about the, uh, the web properties that have um, sort of the most traffic and, and have the, the biggest footprint and impact at the school. Um, so our team uh, consists of two departments. Uh, I work in the communications office, actually, uh, and, and my colleagues here work in, uh, uh, on the web team within IT. Um, and it really consists of three developers. One, one is not here today. <laughs> and, one, and one product owner. So, and so we um, really do all the, all the work and, and vision for um, uh, Planning all this out. Sorry, I'm gonna have to take this off here. Stop jingling in the microphone. Um, all right, and so the types of websites that we work on, we we sort of have you know three to four you know you know products within the the websites that we support. Um, so the main website that we that we talk about is our flagship website, hms.harvard.edu, and we really use this sort of as a launching pad to a lot of the different websites across the um, HMS ecosystem. So it serves as a library or an index. Um, other products we have are, uh, you know, editorial, er, editorial based. Um, we have a magazine website. We have some news content. Um, the primary, uh, you know, focus for, for this talk is really about our departments and offices, um, which sort of share an ecosystem and, and, a, and a main template. Uh, and and then there's some um, uh, course, there's some course websites for our, uh, you know, team that market those those courses. 
So our, our main responsibilities for Office um, is really to maintain the Drupal instance um, and making sure we're adhering to best practices and keeping up to date with all the you know, Drupal and security updates um, to en enhance. So we survey the, the community quite a bit um, on a daily basis actually uh, to think about how we can align and find uh, ways to improve our, our installation, um, main, uh, you know, make accessible Accessibility is a big priority at Harvard, um, and we want to make sure we're you know, up to date on all the best practices for accessibility. Um, I'm sure that's a pretty popular topic from looking at the agenda today uh, for, for, the, for the conference. Um, to train all of the users to, to maintain their websites, we sort of have a train the trainer model, so we really let the individual um, editors manage their own, their own websites and, and manage their smaller teams that support them uh, in maintaining that content. Uh, and then we support our users too, which um, you know anything from um, bugs or um, content fixes, uh, we, we are sort of the central resource to, to help folks with that as well. So how do we address everyone's needs being that we're quite a small team? Um, <laughs> Uh, I think first and foremost, um, I, I kind of think about these things and, you know, four, uh, well, there's a bunch of different principles that we talk about on a day-to-day -day basis. I kind of lumped them into four principles that I like to think about when uh, we're taking on new work and as we engage with our community. Um, and so the, this is really, the, these are really for, you know, our internal uh, audience and our, and our editors on, and how we sort of, again, take on work and how we collaborate. Um, so number one uh, is transparency, right? I'm sure we have to deal with this quite a bit uh, as, as we all work on the web. Uh, you know, we want to build channels like Slack to allow people to reach out if they have issues uh, and feel like they, they can um, and that they're supported when they do so. Uh, and we want to create systems and share the process and how those system works to set expectations for everybody. I think setting expectations is, is really important so we don't overpromise and, and under, under deliver. Um, we want to understand that um, no process is perfect to communicate that. Um, you know, we all make mistakes <laughs> and things happen on the web uh, that sometimes go uh, beyond our control. Uh, and we want to work with people to identify, you know, those, the core, core issues and find solutions that solve the problem. Um, and so we, you know, put a big emphasis on that. Um, and then also, you know, I, I tend to be a more of a big picture thinker, um, so I want to make sure that we're being inclusive in how we're, you know, um, solving pro problems and making sure that our uh, our needs are aligned amongst stakeholders, uh, and that everybody has a chance to, you know, be able to reach out and connect with us. Um, and I think last, just having a transparent and understanding culture just ensures that we you know, are building trust with people, which sort of dovetails into my next point, which is uh, about collaborations and relationship building. Um, I'm, again, really big on this, this topic of relationship building. I think um, without good relationships and, and hard work, projects, uh, you know, hard projects that tend to take a long time or and that people put a lot of effort in, uh, can fail if you don't have a good relationship with the person you're working with. Um, so I think it's really important to, to um, you know, focus on on building that trust and collaboration. Um, uh, you know, work with people to understand and obviously make them feel heard and, and making sure you're building a proactive uh, rapport with people. Um, part of relationship building, I think, is to seek out proactively uh, pain points and with people and, and try to solve them as opposed to waiting for them to come up and, and, and happen. Um, and uh, last, you know, looking for tasks when, when we think about work and in working with people, I, I tend to try to focus on tasks that um, have high impact and relatively low effort. <laughs> so I'm all about keeping the small wins. I think stacking your small wins is, is really important and celebrating those. Um, you know, what maybe a, a low effort job for us uh, might be very impactful for somebody else. So, so I, think, I think seeking those out uh, are really important to try to solve solve those problems, and uh, as it relates to you know building relationships. Um, and lastly, uh, effective collaboration is inclusive, innovative. It aligns and shares. It, sh it helps us align goals uh, and and allows us to share those. Um, and I think by tapping into those diverse perspectives, we can learn new things, identify blind spots, um, and discover creative solutions. Um, and again, it all starts with people and building those relationships.
Um, so this, this next point, um, building elegant solutions through simplicity. Um, again, I've talked about alignment quite a bit. Uh, Cross-functional func collaboration, I think and alignment are key. Uh, to, to build products to scale, it's, it's really imperative for us to you know, obsess over the user, um, both for our editors, the people that are working day to day on the websites, and, uh, and the audience that visits the website. Um, you know, it's important to communicate the sort of the iterative nature of our work. Um, it's always changing, and um, constant refinement and fixes make our website easier to use and manage. Um, and while it takes a lot of work sometimes to get to an elegant solution, ultimately, uh, it pays off because it reduces complexity um, and eliminates, you know, elements or unnecessary features uh, that we might not need that we would then need to support long term. Um, and so just generally, we embrace simplicity as sort of a guiding principle to uh, sort of enhance user experiences and, and reduce the amount of time we spend on development tasks. Um, and again, long term, I think it seeks to like improving scalability and making sure that we can have just one product that, we, that many you know, users can, editors and uh, whatnot can use. Um, and then my last point is, uh, is listening. And so uh, as a dad, I try to be a good, a good listener. <laughs> and I just kind of use that as sort of a guiding principle I, I work to because I think um, it's really crucial to gather you know, it's a crucial tool to gather insights uh, and feedback from people. And, um, you know, as I practice listening with, uh, you know, my colleagues, you know, I try not to interrupt people, be, practice patience and, and making sure that we're hearing every, all the needs and, and, um, and challenges that, that we have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, that can sometimes be really complex and sort of conflicting. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, our editors want one thing that, works for them, but doesn't work for another person. So again, like, you know, listening and taking all that in and being thoughtful about solutions, I think is, is really important. Um, uh, and kind of going back to the relationship point, it helps build trust and rapport. Um, and uh, I think, you know, after we meet with people, I try to, um, you know, summarize key points and make sure that um, we're proactively, again, following up with people to make sure that when we're, again, when we're hearing issues that we're taking action on. Um, all right, so that's my bit of the presentation. So I'm gonna hand it over to Michael, who's going to talk about um, support and how we uh, are able to support these, uh, this community of web editors at the school. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Michael Garofalo. I am a Drupal developer at Harvard Medical School. And the first thing I want to actually talk about today is kind of a quick overview of our overall support process. Um, so the first aspect, it really comes down to handling incoming requests. We have a lot of different uh, individual support channels, uh, such as emails. Sometimes users just find it easier to um, message people that have been working here for 10 plus years. Um, I've been working here close to eight myself. and. We have another developer on the team who's been here for, I think, 27 years. So sometimes people have built up relationships over time, and they just find it easier to reach out to us directly. However, we do have another ticketing system, ServiceNow, that allows users to submit whatever they really see fit, whether it's a bug, a new request, or uh, just a simple question. We noticed that a good amount of questions were coming in through ServiceNow, and we tried to eliminate that by having a Slack channel dedicated to all of our users, uh, as including the web team as well as the communications department. And we can just sit there and talk about you know, different issues that they think might be related to a potential bug that was just introduced to a code deployment or something as simple as just getting a recommendation on how to structure their content. The last real piece of channels we have is an internal development board that we have just for all of the work that we're doing. Uh, it's in JIRA, which I'm sure you all heard of. Um, and it, it's just really just for us developers to go in there and keep track of our work and everything we have on our plates. Now, when it comes to SLAs, we have more of a 20, you know, respond in a 24 hour period, but you know, we tend to, you know, because we're more of a small personalized team, we try to get um, all requests responded within a 12 hour period. That doesn't mean we're gonna solve your issue in 12 hours. Um, a quicker response goes a really long way. So even if we're reaching out to the user and saying, hey, you know, we 
we got your request. We have a little more discovery work to do. Uh, if we have any follow-up questions, we'll be in touch within a day or so. Um, this more or less just gives us time to dissect, do a little more troubleshooting, and if we do need more questions, uh, we can get those ready for when we come time to meet with the user. We tried to complete the request that don't require any development work, such as creating a new user account or you know, creating a redirect. Try to get those completed within one to three hours. You know, try to like half a business day. Um, then for you know, requests or bug fixes that require um, a sprint, like for a development ticket to go into one of our sprints, um, we do let the users know that and we work with Sam in the communications department to figure out when um, we can get this into our sprint as well as determining the priority. So evaluate, evaluating the requests. Um, it really comes down to us communicating with one another because we are such a small team um, and we just want to help understand what's going on and ping ideas back and forth with one another. But with saying that, we kind of have three broad types of requests. Of course, there's outliers, but the first main one we get is bug fixes. It's the most common type of request we get. Um, with our small team size, we don't really have a dedicated QA person or process, so you know bugs tend to get through. Nothing major, but we just work quickly and efficiently to try to determine what the scale of this and if it's impacting one of our sites on the stack or if it's affecting all of them. That will also help determine if we need to do a hot fix or if this is just something that can be rolled out in our next release. The second type of request we have is a website creation or a migration. Uh, we get a good amount of requests, maybe about, uh, about five or so a week um, to either help someone migrate their site onto our platform or ask for our services. Uh, sometimes we even get requests from affiliates, um, different surrounding hospitals. Um, but however, because of our resources and small team size, our resources are limited to you know, certain groups uh, within Harvard. Hopefully that can change with our growing team. Um, well, I, we're slowly growing. Um, so hopefully <laughs> within time we can take on more uh, fun and interesting projects. Speaking of that, the third type would be a new feature. Um, because it's you know within a microsite type um, aspect or an environment, we look into every single one of those requests thoroughly because we're not trying to just do a one-off solution that only helps one site. We're trying to find a solution that can help multiple sites, because that would be something that's worth our resources that could potentially help all the other site and content owners. So this is actually one of my favorite topics, and it's communicating non-technical, or excuse me, communicating feedback to non-technical users. Technology in general, not just Drupal, but technology in general can be incredibly overwhelming. I, I can't tell you how many emails I get of someone asking me for help and them letting me know that they had no intention of even knowing what Drupal is, let alone it being a part of their job. So my goal is to really just help users not have any of those worries or fear. I tell them I, I don't care how they want to reach out to me. When I was in the office, people would come by my desk now they're showing up on my inboxes and asking me to jump on a Zoom call real quick just so they can explain something to me. It's really whatever helps the user uh, communicate um, the issue or whatever they want to to me. And as you can see, I have a link there. This is um, very helpful documentation and information that the team created uh, that we figured it would help reduce you know, basic types of requests such as how do I do this or how do I add a link to a menu? We have all sorts of documentation, whether it's Drupal or we even have a little other documentation for Trumba. But just for the Drupal aspect alone, we have essentially how to get introduced and familiarized with our system. This alone has cut down our training requests that Sam and I used to get all the time. Uh, and it also really helped um, the support tickets go down as well. I'm going to pass it off to Tony. All right. Thank you both. Uh, and let's see what I can do here, if I can fit everything. All right, so a bit of technical background. So we've, uh, 
been talking about our microsites. This is what we call our uh, multi-site install, which was set up um, a few years ago at this point. Background, I'm Tony Savorelli. I'm the web development manager in the web team at Harvard Medical School. I joined the team about 10 months ago. So um, the situation that I found, uh, which was uh, had been developed years uh, before I joined, was the following. We had four, what we call the microsites, we had um, a multi-site install that was trying to unify the way uh, all, all the different uh, department and office sites worked, uh, the way they, the look and feel, the look and feel um, uh, was set up, uh, and generally to make sure that there was, uh, that the, the functionality and the visual aspects were consistent across the board not only uh, within the microsites themselves, but also with our flagship um, uh, site, which uh, uses pretty much uh, the same uh, content and visual components. Uh, so we have an identical configuration with some exceptions. Some sites are, in fact, outliers, and that's fine. We're, we're able to control that. Um, we have, not had, have a homebrewed content structure and front-end components. Uh, which were developed externally and we uh, keep maintaining internally. One of the things uh, that was true until a few months ago was that our multi-site ran on a fat repository, uh, which we uh, hosted and still host on, on Bitbucket, and then uh, separately also pushed to our remote uh, hosting environment. Fat repository meaning, of course, we would run, we would install the multi-site locally, we would run Composer locally and push all the artifacts, which of course um, created a few issues that I will go through. There was no standard configuration management, uh, which meant that all the configuration for each of the sites were stored exclusively uh, or largely, um, let's say exclusively, because that's, I think it's a better, uh, it's a better term for what was happening. Uh, in the uh, in each of the site's uh, databases. As we know, that's kind of scary, especially in a post Drupal 7 world when we can use more modern configuration uh, management. That was, uh, you know, a potential um, breakage point. So the downsides of all of this was that the multi-site or the monolithic setup was very rigid. Uh, it was easier to make uh, mistakes and commit them to, to the repository particularly if multiple developers were working uh, on, on different sites or on the same sites at the same time. Um, our local uh, development environment is uh, Lando. We had no local multi-site uh, support on Lando, uh, meaning that every time somebody had to work on a different site, they would have to you know, wipe everything, download a, the, the database for a different site. It was complicated and tedious. Right, Michael? Right. <laughs> um, all of this made the, both the development and the deployment process slow and error prone. Um, in addition to that, problems during development, which would affect a subset, a single site or a subset of sites, would mean delaying availability for all the sites, sometimes by several hours. And yes, we do have a very swift support uh, system, um, but the worst thing that can happen while you are trying to uh, debug uh, deployment as it's happening is also have, a, have to uh, deal with incoming support requests. So fortunately, uh, we have a very dynamic and uh, dynamic team and uh, with the help of the communications office, <laughs> we're really able to keep that thing uh, under control. Um, release to production would become more burdensome and require change control tickets for relatively minor updates. Um, you know, IT, uh, the IT department at Harvard Medical School is a fairly large department, and change control means having to uh, set up meetings in advance and making, and making sure that all the stakeholders uh, are aware of the changes that are upcoming, that they approve, that there's a sufficient number of approvals um, that are applied to each of the changes, and so keeping this process uh, restricted to to the more uh, complex changes, like say, uh, 
you know, major version Drupal upgrade, that's, that's something that we really want to have change control for. If we have a couple of bug, bug fixes, like you know, some visual styling that needs to be applied, maybe we don't need change control for that. But if we have a development or a deployment process that is inherently um, lengthy and, uh, and potentially um, can potentially create errors, that all of a sudden makes uh, the need for change control uh, for the change control process uh, a lot more obvious. So that was not ideal. Um, and ultimately, because especially because the FAT repository we were working on, uh, we accumulated technical debt and coding consistencies, and so that's never uh, a great uh, thing to work with. And lastly, no standard configuration management uh, made the, not having a standard configuration management made reverting changes pretty much impossible. And uh, that's also kind of scary, the more sites you have. Um, and so that was, when I, when I joined, I, I sort of uh, thought that we could start doing better and progressively we have, uh, we're, we're still working on it. So my goals, uh, my main goal, which is not here, but I'll tell you what it is, uh, is basically this generally my goal for everything move complexity upstream um, if I'm uh, if I'm working with Michael I would like his life to be better so I take on some of the tasks that uh, he doesn't need to worry about every day um, and and he does the same with our with our users I want that I like that model I, I want that model to be uh, scaled up um, and so one of my ideas which is by no means a new idea, it was, it was new for us, was to automate all the uh, uninteresting tasks. We're still in, in the process of doing that. Um, first of all, switch to a lean repository so that we wouldn't have to push all the artifacts from our local to Bitbucket and then to our host. Um, so uh, standardize the build process. We use Bitbucket, so we started using pipelines on Bitbucket to uh, build the sites and push them to our, our hosting provider. Build a solid configuration management. I guess there's, it's hyphenated because I think I'm missing a word there. Never mind. Um, build a solid con uh, configuration management uh, model, really. So especially with a multi-site, that can be um, an, an issue uh, because each of the site needs its own config directory. We, in, in, so both locally and remotely, uh, that was a bit of a head scratcher. Then I'll, in a second, I'll let you know how, how I solved that. Uh, facilitate local development so that we wouldn't have to switch back and forth between uh, databases every time somebody needed to, to work on a different site. Ultimately, increase predictability, uh, reduce effort for us during development and during deployment of, uh, of new releases and downtime for the users. Even just a small change would take up to maybe four hours sometimes to deploy. That's not acceptable and it doesn't matter how many change control tickets we open or, or how much we uh, communicate on Slack to our user, user base, it's still a long time. So. And ultimately, one of the goals would be to strengthen the cohesion among sites in terms of features enabled um, and also at the same time allow more autonomy during development. This is something we're still working on, so I, I don't have a, a secret recipe for that, uh, but we're, we're, we're working on that. Maybe next year I'll have uh, part two of this talk <laughs> ready to go. Um, uh, methods and tools, I've, I've sort of touched on these. Uh, so pipelines and script, uh, so using pipelines, first of all, to, to build our uh, code base uh, and, and make it ready for hosting, uh, and write scripts that would accommodate both our microsites and our standalone sites. Example, um, instead of um, always typing out all the, the repetitive commands that we need to uh, use to deploy, uh, our code, and which are inevitably inevitably going to be different for standalone sites and and, mul and the the multi-site. Uh, I decided to uh, go out of my way to to script them and and uh, 
unify the way we do things uh, in, a, in a rational way. Um, I set up local configuration and settings to allow, uh, to allow running all the, all the entire multi-site stack locally. Um, I don't have examples of that, but especially with Lando, it, it, it seems to be pretty, pretty simple. There's, uh, I had to do some research, but in the end, uh, it's very easy to, uh, uh, to run uh, MySQL commands on Lando so that all the databases that you need are created on local setup. So uh, that was extremely helpful to, um, to our local uh, development process. And ultimately, uh, one of the things that I'm uh, consistently working on is uh, to create scripts to improve control over remote, remote environments if we need to run certain commands across multiple sites or subsets of sites. Uh, the idea of running them individually is um, not great, and so I'm working on uh, running Drush, for example, on a, on a set of sites all at once, uh, or all the sites uh, um, as, as in bulk. So uh, th those were uh, the, the tools that I had in mind. Um, I've been talking about multi-sites, and so when I, when I submitted this proposal, uh, this was November, I want to say. Uh, we had a multi-site, and now we don't. We moved hosting provider to just a few mo months later, um, and uh, because the multi-site install was, so this is a bit of a bait and switch, I, I admit that. Um, I was here uh, coming and, and telling, and just, you know, I wanted to come and have secrets on how to uh, effectively run multi-sites. We were not able to effectively run multi-sites remotely because they, had started becoming too burdensome, uh, and all the reasons that I listed so far on why our uh, setup was difficult, they became even more um, complex uh, and obvious uh, shortly after we submitted this proposal. So new hosting provider, which doesn't allow multi-sites, um, so each site, each, each site is in its own code base, uh, which is actually not a bad idea. The, the moment we made the decision, I, the first thing that I thought was, holy cow, how are we gonna manage this? Because we currently have 34, 38, 34 um, sites in the old multi-site install, and they could grow in number at any time, and we need a solid solution to, to make that process easy, both to create new sites and to maintain existing sites. Um, and, uh, and, and also maintain some continuity uh, with the way we used to do things. Um, removal of single point of failure, uh, other advantages of moving away from a multi-site uh, concept is to lower p the potential downtime for, for a site. Uh, instead, when, when it's deployment time, instead of spending four hours deploying all of the sites, we might still spend a while, depending on how large the, the deployment is, but each site is going to be potentially down. I'm not saying necessarily down. They're, they almost never are down. There was one case last week, but um, uh, it was the IT site, so nobody. <laughs> I know this is being recorded. It's, it's not true. Everyone looks at that. Um, so, but for each site, the, the potential for downtime is very, is very contained and very small. Um, it also, uh, this move also lowered the requirement for change control. Like I said before, if we have very small changes to apply either to all the sites or to just one of them, nobody needs to know. It's going to pretty much happen transparently uh, within our required or communicated window. Uh, the additional uh, advantage is that we could, we can, we have, uh, perform staggered deployments. If for whatever reason, for example, actually, I have an example. Uh, we are uh, going to, in the next few weeks, uh, enable SSO on all of the all of our microsites. It's going to be a staggered deployment. Instead of deploying all the configuration changes all at once to all the sites, plus having to test SSO on live sites before users start, well, using it, it's a little complicated. Um, we are going to deploy this in, um, in in, in batches, basically three days in a row, we're gonna have uh, this deployment, smaller, 
and, uh, and more controllable. Um, however, even though we moved to a non-multi-site uh, install, uh, and despite all the features that our, our new hosting provider provides us with, we still have one issue, what to do locally. Because with a multi-site, we had one local install that controlled several sites. With individual sites, it would be unthinkable to have to install each of them every single time we need to work on any of them. Or not even each of them, but look, we probably all work with Docker, or many of us, we know how slow and painful it becomes after just a few sites are active. So uh, that was my main, one of my main issues there was that I wanted to avoid that. So long live the multi-site. Uh, we're still using the multi-site locally. So we still have one repository on Bitbucket, which is our old repository with all the sites in there, uh, with all the separate configuration directories. Uh, well, not file directories, but it's set up to have separate file directories per site. Um, and we let our pipeline decide where each of them goes. Um, so basically, in our uh, config default direct, or actually not in our config de default, uh, in our, uh, there is a subdirectory in our config uh, directory which contains separate config directories for each site. Once our code base reaches Bitbucket, um, uh, the, there's a script that basically says, oh, you are our alumni site. You're gonna go to this repository. Uh, this directory is going to be renamed config slash default, presumably. I wrote it, it's been a while, sorry. Um, and so from the point of view of our uh, hosting environment, each of them is a single site. None of them contains code that's, well, none of them contains configuration that's specific to other sites. It's still originally a multi-site, so there is going to be um, uh, uh, contrib modules that are uh, common to all of them. But again, like I said before, we still want to maintain as much as possible the coherence between all the sites and so uh, the code that's actually um, specific to each of, to, to very few of them is, is very little and so it's not a big concern. I built some custom Drush scripts for bulk administration so that I can pull down all the code from, or sorry, all the databases and all the files from all the sites if I want all at once, if I <laughs> really uh, want some uh, uh, pain in my life, uh, which is not that painful actually. Um, and we also set up a branching strategy uh, and sort of a conditional pipeline situation. I, I have a few screenshots or a few diagrams uh, that I'm gonna show. How are we doing with time? We're still working, okay. Um, there are a few minor uh, downsides. Um, well, I had a lot more to say, I'm not gonna say it. Um, we have a few minor downsides of all of this. Obviously, deployment, because instead of deploying a single code base to a multi-site, we're deploying 30 core code bases. Deployments can overall take longer. But for the single site, it takes a lot less. So each site gets deployed pretty much in a couple of minutes, I wanna say. Um, of course, multiply a couple of minutes for, you know, by uh, 34 sites, that's, that's uh, pretty substantial, but at least each individual site is not going to feel the pain of a large deployment. Um, the other main downside that, that I, pain point really, that I feel right now and I'm trying to work um, to solve I might actually have a final slide at the end, uh, is that it's hard to monitor the status of all the, uh, uh, of all the separate site, oops, uh, I should, this is why I'm, I'm holding my hands here, I don't wanna hit anything. Um, it's hard to monitor the entire process without opening a new terminus, sorry, terminal uh, window, uh, one for each site. Um, so we'll, we'll get there too. So I have a few uh, screenshots. Uh, we are, uh, uh, so our hosting provider uh, has a tagging uh, feature, uh, which we use very extensively. Um, so as you can see here, I'm not gonna go into the 
finer details of, of what we do. But pre-release, for example, with pre-release tag, uh, these six sites are tagged with pre-release, which corresponds to our pre-release uh, branch. Every time we uh, uh, commit and push the pre-release branch to our Bitbucket repo, the, the branch gets built, and only these six sites get uh, actually deployed for, uh, on, on dev. Uh, which means that we don't actually have to wait for all the sites to be uh, to, to be built and deployed every time. We just need to 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 uh, apply minor change. Um, these we consider to be uh, the sites that are more representative of our stack, and so that's uh, useful to us. Um, I've also uh, I I talked about. Let me see what's next. Oh yeah yeah, I'll get there. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> Um, I um, also talked about uh, conditional pipelines. Uh, this, is part, this is what I consider also a conditional pipeline. Uh, uh, you see the data layer and the refactor uh, tags there. Refactor, for example, when I was re rewriting a bunch of, uh, a, a bunch of code for, for the sites, I didn't want, again, I didn't want uh, that code to necessarily go into the master uh, branch in, in the remote um, in the remote environments, in the remote, in the hosting uh, environment for all the sites, uh, so I wanted to use a separate uh, development environment for that specific purpose. Basically, if I create a branch on my local called demo slash branch or demo slash refactor in this case, I push that branch to Bitbucket. My script feels that it knows that it's a special branch and it's going to push it to our uh, host as the refactor branch on the host, and then I can, can create a um, separate environment on it. And so I can even more isolate um, uh, that part of the process. It's very much all in my head. I mean, it's, we've been using it, so it, it exists and it works. So hopefully it makes sense the way I'm trying to convey this to you all. Um, so this is a very generic uh, idea of what we're doing. Uh, if we have a feature branch, like coming uh, branch created uh, from Jira, um, for example, I don't know, web-123, whatever, uh, that feature branch is going to go, uh, is going to be built, um, actually, no, sorry, the feature branch is not going to get built, it's going to get built only if it reaches a demo branch, at which point it becomes a candidate for a separate environment. Uh, the pre-release branch is always built and built into the master on the into the master branch in our hosting repository, and the master branch also gets built into the master branch in our hosting repository, but for all the sites at once. So pre-release only gets built into a subset of those sites when they are tagged with pre-release. Master is always built on all that. So we don't push to master until uh, unless and until we're really ready to uh, to deploy. And then we go into test and live and we tag um, and all of that. Um, uh, so basically when it's deployment time, I have two windows open. One is deploying to test and a few moments later I'm, I'm, I start deploying to live. Um, it works, but of course, as I said before, it's, it's still a little bit more convoluted than I, than I would like it to become and I'm working towards fixing that as well. Um, and finally, one of my scripts is a funky little thing that I, that I built that basically once we uh, tag our code for, for deployment with a, with a uh, release tag, um, my little script just grabs the release notes from the tag itself and uh, deploys it to test, de deploys it to live, and um, just enters the release notes as a message so we always know what's happening. Um, it's complex. It's um, funky, um, but one of my main ideas is that our Bitbucket repo for all our sites is our main source of truth. Whatever happens on the remote host doesn't matter much as long as the code works and the code is clean. Um, I don't uh, care too much about how clean the history of that repository is because that's expendable in my view. Um, if we had to switch Hosting providers, again, for whatever reason, um, our source of truth is what matters. Um, 
So there's room for improvement. Uh, I would like to have a pipeline-driven deployment so that I don't have to control it from my local every time. I or Michael or... Um, and I would also like to be able to uh, build concurring bulk operations so that they're not sequential and we don't have to wait for all of them to happen. Uh, and we can deploy all the sites or do operations on, on, on the sites uh, all at once. I would love some bulk monitoring. Haven't gotten there yet. We'll see. Um, and then this is not really something I'm necessarily into anymore, uh, the idea of having Composer run on our uh, hosting provider. I think the pipelines, this, this was my idea a few months ago and now I'm, I'm changing my mind. I think our uh, pipeline-based setup is still working pretty well. And so I like the control that I get from running Composer the way I want to, the way I want to run it and for the hosting environment to host all our artifacts. I always know what's in there, so. Um, and I think that was that. Uh, so, thank you. I hope this made sense. And uh, if you have any questions, we're here to answer them. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, can everybody hear me okay? Um, so the question was, how is our train the trainer system set up, essentially? Um, so, so basically, with each site, we sort of designate um, a primary owner of the site. Um, and so I will work with that primary owner quite a bit on making sure they understand, you know, all the different features of that website, what to do, what not to do, you know, accessibility, mandatory accessibility um, things and whatnot. Uh, and then it would be their responsibility then as they onboard new employees or, you know, have share responsibility with other people to then teach those people. So that way, each, each website, you know, even though we, they look and feel largely the same, you know, we want to make sure that they have their independence, that they run it the way they want to run it because they're going to, have a different idea of how to lay a page up than, than maybe than maybe I would. So um, yeah, we really give the independence to to the individuals uh, and, their, and the site owners. Yes. Yeah, so typically those requests come in from us. Um, and because Harvard is such a really confusing and big place, it has to go through a specific um, process. We have a committee that we call our use of name committee. It sort of has to get approved by that, that committee. Uh, and that committee um, you know, exists basically to make sure that the Harvard brand, the Harvard Medical School brand specifically is being represented you know, in the way that we want it to be represented. And so, Really, when we're talking about the sites that we're talking about today, these are all external facing websites and um, they all have, you know, good traffic and, and, and whatnot. Uh, we recently went through a big process of kicking people off the website because we have this large affiliate network that you may or not, not be uh, familiar with where um, 16 or so hospitals is where our uh, MD students essentially um, are taught at, at the school. So, and, and sorry, the, the question was about website governance and, and how we go about that uh, and onboarding new, new, new projects. Um, so that would be the, the primary, and then I think the, the secondary, we would, once they get approved, we work with in one individual, again, kind of going back to the train the trainer model, uh, we would work with one uh, individual to help set that up and make sure they're sort of the primary point of contact. So there's not too many people talking to us, you know, at once, because I think that can get kind of, you know, convoluted. Yeah, back there.
So the question is about how to maintain uniformity between sites uh, or among sites, really, uh, with a non, with a multi-site slash not multi-site uh, setup. Um, we're working on that. <laughs> I'll be honest. It was hard to maintain uh, uniformity before then. Uh, one of the things that had been an established practice was used to be uh, to have, um, I'll say the word, um, partial config imports across the sites. For the time being, it's still our, it pains me to say this, it's still our official, the, the way we officially do that. Um, but we also have features installed because uh, who the, the agency that created our current setup used it for some, it was an agency thing, right? Or did it create those internally? Like, sorry, uh, again, I've been there 10 months. I'm not, I, I don't have the full, <laughs> I still don't have the full understanding of who created what. Uh, but yeah, we, we also have features installed here and there. Um, and uh, I've, I've seen some cringing, uh, I saw some cringing earlier about features. I used to use features a lot in Drupal 7 and I'm sort of thinking that it might still be viable to, to maintain uniformity. Haven't made my final decision yet, but yeah, I, it's a question mark still. Sorry, I don't have an answer. I'll do uh, one last question and then we'll wrap it up. Thank you. Um, so I, I'm probably the primary point of contact for the, the community. Um, and so I would say we sort of have an internal priority as far as the super users or the websites that get a lot of traffic. Um, and so when I say daily, I really mean, um, you know, like our, our marketing group, for example. Uh, you know, we'll have monthly meetings with them and we'll touch base on a daily basis if, um, you know, we're working on rolling out a, a big feature, uh, a big one that we're working on right now that I'm sure many of you are is this transition to, from universal analytics uh, to GA4. Uh, which is, we have to meet with them, you know, several times a week at, at this point to get all those things uh, buttoned up. Um, and so really my point on that is just kind of thinking ahead and looking at their scope and making sure that they have an avenue to reach out to us uh, if they're, um, you know, thinking about projects and we're not just getting uh, last minute, you know, projects sprung on us if, uh, you know, we're not, if we're not aware of them essentially. Great. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you.